Hi, I'm Christine Hernandez, Livestock Specialist for Heifer USA at Heifer Ranch in Perryville, Arkansas. Thank you so much for watching this YouTube video on how we raise our pastured poultry. We will cover topics ranging from setting up our brooder, caring for the turkeys while they're in the brooder, bringing them out to pasture, and then their whole life out on pasture. As you're watching this video, if you find value in it, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you have any questions, leave a comment below or email us at heiferusa at heifer.org. With our turkey brooder, we are using a existing barn and we just use the stalls to make multiple different brooder rooms that allows for expansion as the turkey poults age. Our brooder space is composed of two rooms and an outdoor covered pen area. As members of the Grassroots Farmers Cooperative, we adhere to the grassroots spacing standards for our turkeys, and these increase weekly as the turkeys grow. For the first week, we allot the turkeys at least one third square foot per turkey poult, meaning that with 500 turkeys, our brooder space should be at least 165 square feet. When the turkey poults arrive, they go to room one, which is 13 by 13 feet. With our first room, that's where we're really going to concentrate that heat and have their food and water everywhere and make it 95 degrees back there for them. Once they are one week old, we'll give them access to room number two, which is also 13 feet by 13 feet. Turkey poults can't regulate their body heat until they're around 10 to 14 days old. So we really just need to, to make sure that we are providing them with the proper environment and the proper heat. And with those two rooms, we'll decrease that temperature by one degree each day or roughly five degrees a week until the turkeys can regulate their own body temperature and they will be at the ambient temperature that's outside that we'll put them into when they go out to pasture. And to help do that, we also give our turkeys access to outside with a covered pen, and that will also help them acclimate to the outdoor temperature. That's really important because we will be doing three batches of turkeys this year, starting in March and going through November. And so it's, it's important for the turkeys to be ready to go out to pasture depending on that season. The outdoor covered pen is also 13 feet by 13 feet and it's enclosed with wooden fencing as well as horse panels so the turkey poults cannot go through and get out. We've added a small door and a ramp so the turkey poults can easily move from room number two to the outdoor covered pen. We will keep the turkeys in the brooder for four to six weeks until they go out to pasture. Uh, once they're that, that three to six week range, we give them access outside and then we'll bring them in and, and lock them in at nighttime just to keep predators away and to keep them safe. With turkeys being vulnerable, you wanna make sure to not rush them out to pasture. And so with that four to six weeks, you're really looking to see if those turkeys are acclimated to the outdoor temperature, uh, if the weather outside is going to be appropriate for you to expose them out to pasture. Uh, in the springtime, you know, if it's going to be raining and really cold at nighttime, you might want to keep them in the brooder for a week longer until the weather gets a little bit nicer. But that's where you make sure that you have calculated for extra space to keep those turkeys in there for just a few more days. It's not necessary for you to give your turkeys access to outside or even to pasture while they're still in your brooder. We do that because we needed that extra space as the turkeys were growing. Our insulated covered area is only so big. And so just to allow them to be outside, you know, give them a little bit more space, we are giving them that space through a covered outdoor area. If you're not able to do that, that's okay. You just need to make sure that your turkeys are acclimated to the outdoor temperature before you take them out of your brooder. We are here in our turkey brooder. The turkey poults will arrive here shortly. We are just going to go over how we have our brooder set up and everything we have to have ready for their arrival. Three important things for your brooder is to make sure that it is kept clean, it's kept dry, and it is kept warm. Those three elements are essential to produce a healthy flock. You want to prepare for your turkey arrival a few days before they're going to get here. 
You want to make sure that all of your feeders and your waters and your pans are clean and sanitized. You want to put your, your flooring down, whatever you're going to use, whether it's shavings or peat moss. You want to turn on your heat source. For our turkeys this year, we will be using multiple heat lamps hanging from the ceiling and we'll secure those in two or three different ways. So from a chain and some zip ties, as well as the cord that plugs it into the outlet. We are using two different types of heat lamps in our brooder. These metal ones are simple ones that you can just purchase from your local farmer's co-op or from the tractor supply store. I really like Premier One hanging heat lamps. They are structured better. They're more reliable to be using in a brooder situation like this. So we are using a 250 watt red light bulb. You can just get those from your local uh, co-op or from any hardware store. You want to make sure to use red because that is going to allow the poultry to, to sleep and to rest rather than having a white light bulb in there. You want to turn those on at least 24 hours before your turkey poults get here. That way the room is up to temperature. The floor is at the proper temperature. You need to be very careful if you're using heat lamps. They, they can be rather dangerous. Um, so make sure that they're secured in multiple ways. If it's too hot in the brooder space for the turkeys, the way you lower the temperature is to raise that heat lamp further away from the ground. If you observe that your turkey poults are all huddled together underneath your heat lamp, then that's a sign that they are cold. Okay, so they are trying to, to get underneath that heat and warm up. So you may need to lower your heat lamp or increase the temperature if you're using a, a different heat source. If they're all piled in, in a corner or on one side of your brooder, that might mean that there's a draft coming in somewhere. Turkeys and chicks are very vulnerable to drafts and they do not like drafts whatsoever. So if you, you come in and observe that, you need to figure out where that draft is coming from and, and take care of that. If the turkeys are all spread out uh, as far apart as I can get, and it looks like they're, they're laying flat on the ground, then they're probably too hot. So it's important that you have some sort of, of thermometer so you can know what the temperature is. We have an indoor-outdoor thermometer. The thermometer will give you two separate readings, so the, the temperature at the turkey level and then the temperature wherever that second monitor is placed. So you'll need to also pay attention to the humidity within your brooder. If it's a wet humidity, then your temperature doesn't necessarily need to be at 95. It may need to be lower than that. Whatever makes those turkey poults comfortable. If it's a dry humidity, you may need to increase that temperature. Due to the re-renovation of this brooder space for our turkeys, our option was to use heat lamps. It's what we have available. We didn't want to purchase anything really new to put in here. Other ways to heat your brooder would be with propane heat hoods or a radiant heater. Sometimes when producers use those, they will use corrugated cardboard and make rings underneath those heaters so that they concentrate those turkeys underneath that heat source instead of giving them um, a whole room or a whole space. Now I'll just go over the other pieces of equipment that you will have in your brooder. When the turkey poults get here, you want to make sure that you have food and water available to them everywhere. We use corrugated cardboard and we just put the food directly on top of the cardboard. We want those turkeys to be able to walk onto the food, scratch it, eat it, lay in it, all that good stuff. So they can go right on top of that food and start consuming it. Uh, we will keep the cardboard down here for two or three days. And then we'll, we'll take that away and use other feeders in, in that place. You can use anything that is flat and you can put directly on the ground that can hold a, a good amount of food for the turkeys to, to get on there and start eating. So in addition to the cardboard, we also have some rectangle feed pans. We just bought these from a local poultry equipment store. Uh, you can probably get them from, from your local co-op, but that serves the same purpose as the cardboard. These you can wash and sanitize and reuse again. Um, we will use these red pans a little bit longer into our, our brooding timeline compared to the cardboard, uh, but those will hold um, just as much feed, if not more, and allows the turkey poults to get on there and start consuming food right away. 
Turkeys are going to require a little bit of a different ration compared to your broiler chickens. They need a higher percent protein to start off with. We start ours at a 26% protein. If you don't have a, a place where you can regulate that ration, you can buy um, game starter from, from your co-op. That percent protein will be a little bit higher. You can also take some hard boiled eggs, shell and all, and just uh, crumble them over top of their feed. And that will increase the amount of protein that they're getting as well. Due to our feed storage space, we don't have a available bin to have our feed unloaded into. So we just use these um, one ton tote bags and we'll have a couple of them here at a time. We can easily move them around the farm with a front end loader of a tractor. And then to get the feed out of here, we'll just scoop it up with a five gallon bucket, a coffee can, or, or just a scoop to, to fill that bucket up if we're not able to scoop up enough. We are using a non-GMO ration that consists of cracked corn, roasted soybeans, and a number of different ingredients. As you're placing your feed and water out in your brooder, getting ready for your poults to arrive, you really wanna think about where you're placing them at. You don't wanna place your feed and water directly under your heat lamp, because if the turkeys are too warm, you don't want them to have to be underneath that heat to eat and drink. I like to place the water and the feed around the, the heat circle that the heat lamp is, is putting off. That way they can be near the heat or cool off if, if they would like. You want your feed and water to be throughout your whole brooder space when your turkeys first arrive and you want those to be very dense so that there's plenty of space for the, all the turkeys to eat and all the turkeys to drink. And then no matter where the turkey goes, you want them to run into either food or water. That's going to really help increase their, their consumption and then that will help produce a healthier flock. With this new brooder space, we don't have automated water lines. Um, that would be something that I would add into this brooder space if we use it again. Uh, so instead of water lines, we are just using temporary waterers. We have a few five gallon waterers that we will use as well as some one gallon waterers. We use both of these for, um, for other poultry as well, so they're, they're multi-purpose. Um, it's important that you, that you have enough food space and enough water space for all of the poultry to eat and drink at the same time. It, it is water that is going to drive the feed consumption, so you always wanna make sure that there's water available. If at chore time you come in and all the waters are empty, that's going to tell you that you need to add more waterers. You need to make sure that there's water available all the time. With the bigger five gallon waterers, the, the amount of space for the, for the water to fill is deeper and bigger than with the one gallon waterers. So if you start having turkeys get into that waterer, you can always simply take marbles and put them in that water trough space and that will make your water more shallow so your turkeys can't get in there and get soaking wet um, and that may cause additional issues. So the, the marbles will make your water more shallow. It will still allow for the turkeys to drink, they just can't get into it. And these may actually help attract the turkeys to the water. Turkeys are notorious for not being very good water drinkers. Anything to help encourage them to drink water is important. After we take away the cardboard feeder space, we will introduce a different feeder to the turkeys, and that may be one of these turbo feeders. These hold about 10 pounds of food, and there's a little trough here. Um, once they're about 10 or 12 days old, these are a little small for them, so they're only useful for a few days. And then we may switch to um, one of these five gallon bucket feeders. It's a Featherman feeder that will hold about 25 pounds of food. Then we'll also hang our red cool feeders that hold 30 pounds of food. And those are the feeders that the turkeys will use for the rest of their time here at the ranch. Ventilation inside your brooder is very important. With this new space that we created, we just simply got a few window fans and mounted them in the walls. So this fan is bringing air from outside into our brooder. So it's replenishing the air in the brooder with fresh air. And then we have a fan opposite this on a different wall, and that is taking the air inside this brooder space outside. So we're just circulating the air. 
you want to make sure that you're able to do that about six to eight times a day. So having one of these on a timer would be excellent. So it's important to keep this fan on to help keep a fresh circulation of air within your brooder. We mounted this fan um, high up on the wall so that fresh air could come in, but it, so that it doesn't create a draft on the pulse. So you don't have to set it up exactly like this. You just wanna make sure that you have a flow of fresh air coming into your brooder. You could place this in an existing window or create a space for it in a wall, whatever works best for you in your space. There are a number of different types of, of bedding you can use for turkeys. In the past, we've used uh, Kinlan dried pine shavings. That's what we use for our chickens right now as well. This year, I am trying out peat moss. The reason why I am switching to peat moss is because the turkeys will not try to consume the peat moss like they would with the pine shavings. Our early mortalities will hopefully be decreased with that. Peat moss is going to be more expensive than a bag of pine shavings. Peat moss will go a little bit further. And so at the end of your, your brooding timeline, those two should equal out. You should spend the same amount of money on pine shavings as you would on peat moss. You're just gonna have to use more bags of pine shavings throughout the whole brooder time. Uh, they're not as absorbent. They don't control the ammonia smell as well as the peat moss does. With peat moss, you can go ahead and clean out your brooder and put it directly on your garden. With the pine shavings, you're gonna have to, to compost those down for a long time. Another pro to using peat moss is that the turkeys really enjoy to take a dust bath in it. So as we're putting down more peat moss, um, they will all come over and just start uh, rolling around and dusting themselves in it. Um, so you may get it on, on your heat lamps or on your fans and, and things like that, and that's okay. Uh, the peat moss is going to get in your water and on your food. Um, it's not gonna hurt the turkey poults at all. It's just gonna make things look a little messy, but that's okay. You can easily clean all that up. Behind me, you can see that our corner is rounded off. Turkeys are notorious for piling up in corners and that can cause the ones on the bottom to suffocate. So we just have a simple piece of plywood back there and then we use corrugated cardboard to round off that corner even more. And you wanna keep your corners rounded for at least the first week and a half or two until they start being more active and starting to fly and, and jump onto things. You want to remove those corners before they're old enough to, to fly up on there and, and try to perch on there and then potentially fall behind there and, and other turkeys will join them and cause a pile up. If you don't have the corrugated cardboard or, or plywood that you can put there, there are other materials you can use to round off your corners. Whatever, whatever you have, whatever works for you and your farm. There are a number of different places that you can purchase your turkey poults from. Turkey poults are gonna be more expensive than a chick. On average, they're gonna be anywhere from about $6 to $12, depending if you want a production breed compared to a heritage breed. You just need to, to know what you want and then um, look for that out there. Ordering your turkey poults, there will more than likely be a minimum number that you have to order. So when you do that, make sure you have enough equipment and breeder space for the number of turkeys you order. If you order them from a well-known hatchery, they'll more than likely show up through the mail. So your local post office will call you when they arrive there for you to come and pick them up. They will be roughly two to three days old by the time you get them. We get our turkey poults from a hatchery out of Virginia. So being a part of the Grassroots Farmers Co-op, we have a member that will go and pick up those turkey poults and deliver them to us turkey farmers. By the time we get them, they are just over a day old. Ordering them through the mail, you may have the option of adding in like an extra nutrient pack or an electrolyte pack. Um, I would recommend that just because you don't know how, how stressful that transport is going to be on them. Once our turkey poults arrive here, we want to get all of our boxes, bring them into our brooder, make sure we, we close the door behind us so that we can really keep that heat in here. 
and then we'll space those boxes around our brooder. And then we're gonna go one box at a time. We will take out one pole at a time. We'll dip their beaks in the sugar water. We put one cup of sugar per gallon of water, and that just helps give those turkey poults a little bit of a boost to energy because they just traveled all the way here. They were just hatched um, about a day ago. So we dip each beak in the sugar water. As we're doing that, we wanna keep track of how many turkeys we are putting out. That way we know how many turkeys we're starting with. That way we make sure we get the number of turkeys that we actually ordered. So I will dip their beak and then I will go and place that turkey poult on their food. We will use the same record template that we used for our broilers. So we wanna write down the initial number of turkey poults that we receive, the date they got here, if they're a, a special breed or anything like that, we'll record that. We will be raising broad-breasted whites this year. We keep track of the number of bags of bedding that we put down, whether that's going to be pine shavings or the peat moss. We'll keep track of how many buckets of feed that we give out, and we'll keep track of any mortality losses that occur. We will leave the overhead lights on for three days, and so that's to ensure that the turkey poults will be up, and that encourages them to, to eat their food and, and drink their water for the first 72 hours, and then after that, we will set the lights to a timer. We have our overhead lights connected to a light timer, so no one has to come back and, and physically do that. We also have a separate switch for the heat lamps. That way the, we don't have to go around and unplug each individual heat lamp. We can just do it with the switch. Turkeys are very vulnerable and fragile, so it's important that we spend a lot of time with them when they first get here. They need a, a mother figure. They need to imprint on somebody. And so if you can spend as much time as possible in your brooder for the first couple weeks when those turkeys get here, so they develop a relationship with you that will make them happier, that will have them eat more and drink more. It's important to observe them, not just during your chore time. So if you can observe them in between chore times and really just take a look in here and see what it is that they're doing, it's during that chore time that you come in here and, and you disturb what they're doing. So you're gonna change their water, you're gonna give them more feed, they're gonna get up and be more active than if you weren't here. So if you just peek in and make sure everyone is doing okay, so they're not crowding in the corners, they're not huddling underneath the heat lamp, those are signs you need to look for that you may need to change a few things in your brooder. To help teach the turkeys to, to eat their food and to drink their water right off the bat, we are going to put in some week old broiler chicks with them. So they should, should watch those chicks and learn from them. Uh, when you're doing that, you need to make sure that there's still going to be enough feeder space, enough water space, because you're adding more beaks than just the number of turkeys that you ordered. Uh, you only wanna leave the chicks in here for the, the first two weeks or so um, until the turkeys start, start messing with them and then take them out and put them back with their broiler flock. If you don't have broiler chicks to put in here with your turkeys, that's okay. You just need to make sure that you're able to spend time with them and that they can imprint on you and start that relationship. It's very important for turkeys at every age to have access to grit, which is just granite rocks. A lot of people think that when you're raising turkeys on pasture that they can just get grit from the soil and from the ground, but it's actually really important to offer it to them so they have access to it all the time. And so we give them free choice grit. For the turkeys, we start when they're just a couple days old and the grit will come in, in different sizes, different diameters. So we use cherry stone grit and we just get that from our local feed co-op. So for the young turkeys, we start with grit number one, and we will just top dress their feed with that. So we can just go ahead and sprinkle it on top of those rectangle pans so that the turkeys have, have access to it while they're eating. After about two weeks old, they will get access to grit number two, and then they'll move on to grit number three and four at their appropriate ages. So grit is important for, for all poultry to have because the way poultry eat and grind up their food is a part of their stomach is called the gizzard. 
And so that's going to be their mechanical stomach. So after it goes from their crop down into their gizzard, they're actually breaking that down and, and grinding it down. So having access to that grit keeps rocks in there so they can efficiently digest what's in their ration. The turkey poults have been here for a few days now, so I will take you and show you how we do our brooder chores with them. They are more labor intensive than our chicken brooder chores, just because these, this is a very manual brooder that we have. We have multiple gallon waterers set up that we take out, we, we rinse and clean them off, give them fresh water and place them back down on the floor. We do that twice a day. With their feed pans, we top dress the feed so that attracts the turkey poults back to it. If there's anything dirty in there, we'll go ahead and pick that out at that time. We will put down fresh peat moss in areas that need it. Using peat moss, uh, you have to use very little of it. You have to replenish it, not very often. And so sometimes I'll just put it around where the waters have been, if there's been a spilt water or water leak or anything like that. We will walk along the turkey poults just to make sure that everyone is doing okay. If they're piling up in a certain area, we'll go and, and separate them so they'll get up and go and eat and drink and, and rest someplace else. Uh, we will also check our thermometer, make sure that the temperature in here is okay. Since we are using the heat lamps, we have to keep a really close eye on the temperature, make sure it's not too hot and not too cold and that it's not varying more than one or two degrees at a time. For the first week, we want it to be around 95 degrees, and then after that, we can start letting it get just a little bit cooler, only one degree at a time. So we'll check the heat lamps, make sure that they're at a proper height, make sure the turkey poults aren't trying to stay away from them, because that would indicate that it's too hot under there. We want to make sure that the turkey poults aren't gathering in one specific area that would show that, that they're cold or that they're, they're piling for some reason. If they're all underneath the heat lamps, then they're cold and we need to increase the heat in the brooder a little bit. If anyone is uh, off by themselves or like hunched over and just doesn't look very good, uh, picking them up, giving them some attention, dipping their beak in some water, placing them on the food, uh, just to help give them a little boost of energy. Since the turkeys have been here for a few days, they have graduated from having the roll of cardboard on the floor with feet on top of it. And we've placed four red hanging feeders in here. And those hold about 35 pounds of feed. So we can go ahead and fill those up and that will make sure that there's fresh feed access all times. And we'll just come in and shake it down and, and refill it as needed. These are also the red feeders that they will use during the other stages of their brooding and out on pasture. So we're just getting them used to those feeders now. Our, our water system is labor intensive because we're using the individual gallon waterers. That is one thing I, I would have as an improvement with our brooder is to put in an automatic water line. There's specific turkey water lines and they come with little water bowls that the turkeys are attracted to and they'll drink out of. But with our watering system, we need to make sure that the turkeys never run out of water. So if I come in here at one point and a lot of their gallon waters are empty, that means that I need to provide them with more water containers so that they always have access to water. Before we leave our brooder, we make sure and we go and record everything on our record sheet. So if we had any dead turkey poults, we will record that. We'll record if we put down any peat moss and then how many buckets of feed we used. And we do that because we want to keep good track of what inputs we're using. So how much feed they're consuming, how much peat moss we have to use throughout their whole brooding time, and then just keep track of any mortality so that we can know how many turkeys we have. The turkeys are now just over two weeks old and they have graduated into their second brooder room. So we gave them access to the second room first through just a little flap on the door to help keep the major heat in that back first room. And then they can come and go into the second room as they wanted to. The second room we set up just like that first room. So we had some of the heat lamps hanging from the ceiling so that there was still a good amount of heat in the second room but we are starting to gradually decrease that heat. 
So each week we need to decrease the overall brooder temperature by five degrees. When we're using the heat lamps, you can do that just by raising that heat lamp a, a notch or two up the chain and that will decrease the, the temperature on the pult level. We are still using our, our gallon and our five gallon waterers that we have to take out and bring in uh, each tour time. But now that the turkeys are a little bit taller and bigger, we have put some smaller cinder blocks underneath those waterers that allows the turkeys to, to drink at their shoulder level. And it helps keep the, the inside, the water trough area clean and there's less peat moss getting in there. So the turkey poults have access to, to more water all the time. It's very important that we have extra waters, that the turkeys always have access to water because it's going to be their water consumption that drives their feed consumption. Also in the second room, we have a few different types of feeders. We still have those rectangle feeder pans out there that the turkeys really enjoy eating out of. We have the red hanging feeders that the turkeys will use out on pasture. And then we've also just gotten a few of the Featherman feeders, which are a five gallon bucket with a, a green bottom that, that screws onto there. Uh, something that, that we have to use with those five gallon buckets is actually putting a lid on top of there. So once the turkeys get to about two weeks old, they are more adventurous and they really like to perch on top of things. So you'll see them uh, behind me, we have this, this shavings wall that gives us access into the brooder without actually stepping into the turkey area at first. Uh, the turkeys will come and sit up here and, and perch up here. And so in this second room, the turkeys have access to the corners. And that's because the chances of them piling has significantly decreased as long as we are watching the temperature and the turkeys don't get cold and there's not a draft. Uh, once the turkeys are at about this two week age, if they have something to, to fly up on and perch on, then they will. And if those corner boards are accessible, there's a chance of them perching on there, falling behind that board, and more and more turkeys piling on there, and then suffocation can happen with those turkeys on the bottom. Uh, this second room also has those exhaust fans, just the same way as, as the first room does. And there's two exhaust fans in room number two, two exhaust fans in room number one. Room number two also has a few more windows that we can open and close depending on what the weather is like outside. And so it's this room number two where we really start to acclimate those turkeys to the outside temperature and to the outside environment. So during the day when the weather is really nice, we can go ahead and unplug those heat lamps. And then if it's going to be cooler temperatures at nighttime, we can plug those back in so that that temperature stays within a good range for those turkeys. When they are between three and four weeks old, depending on the outside temperature, we will be giving them access to an outside covered pen. And then following that, they will move out to our pasture schooners and that will be between four and five weeks of age. So every Tuesday that we have poultry here at Heifer Ranch, we take weights on those birds and we record them in just a simple, small notebook. And you can see all the ones that we've taken before. And what we do with this notebook is we write what batch it is. So for example, this is our third turkey batch of the year. Uh, when we do our poultry batches, we just say batch one, two, three, etc. We have the date, we have what breed they are. So these are broad breasted whites. On this paper, we also keep track of the feed consumption for that whole week the mortalities for that week, and then if we had to call any birds that week. And then we will use the rest of this page to record the weights of our turkeys. We take 15 weights. What we like to do is to go and find the largest bird that we can see, the smallest bird that we can see, and then just the other 13 will be uh, average or just uh, random birds. And that will help give us a good average weight of our whole flock. That way we can see how they're growing, how much weight they're gaining, um, to see and make sure that they are on target for their scheduled processing date. To take their weights, we just use a fishing scale 
You can get this off of Amazon. I believe they're like eight or $10. One of these will last us a couple seasons. You know, you just need to replace the battery. We just use a five gallon bucket that has a handle. Uh, we have a, a ton of those hanging around. And then we keep all of that together in just a simple pencil pouch that you can buy from the store. That way we're not trying to go around and find everything. Things don't get lost, it all stays here. And we hang it on the wall um, in the office when we're done. And so to, to weigh the turkeys, we have the fishing scale connected to just some regular rope. And I like to tie it up so that the bucket is always hanging. I don't have to reset the scale throughout my, the 15 weights and I, I don't have to hang on to the scale, catch the turkey in the bucket. You know, everything is ready to go once I have that turkey in hand. So the first thing you wanna do is turn your scale on with the bucket on your scale. That way it will zero itself out. Then you are not adding the, the weight of the bucket to the weight of the turkey. This will just give you the weight of the turkey. Okay, so it's at zero right now. I will go and find a turkey. When you have your birds, whether it's turkey or chickens, you want to use both hands. Make sure you control their wings so they don't try to flap around and get away from you. They don't hurt themselves or you. Um, I like to get control of their legs with my pinky fingers, okay? And then you just simply put them in the bucket. With turkeys, they can be a little jumpy, so I like to just keep my hand in the bucket, not on the turkey, but just to help prevent him from trying to jump out. This turkey weighs 1.95 pounds. So you can just take your bucket off your scale, you know, let your turkey or your chicken walk out of the bucket, replace your bucket, and you're ready to go for the next turkey. Put your second turkey in there. With this scale, all I have to do is re-push the on button and it will automatically start weighing this turkey. This turkey is 2.04 pounds. So we will do that all the way for 15 turkeys just to help us get a good average of, of how much our flock weighs. So we are doing batches of 500, so we're just doing 15 out of 500. Um, it doesn't seem like very many, but when you're going around trying to catch 15 turkeys as they get older, uh, 15 sometimes feels like a lot. Thank you so much for watching our YouTube video. I hope you're able to learn something or take something away from this. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you have any questions, leave a comment below or email us at heiferusa at heifer.org.